the evidence-based chiropractor has a lot of things on it, right? There's, there's like the research, there's some awesome products, um, there's even a student portal, but we'll get more into that. How do you describe the evidence-based chiropractor? Well, I think it's evolved as time has went on, but right now I'd say it's tools for chiropractors to grow their practice. So initially it was more strictly research-based, um, but as time went on, I found that there was you know, some things in my practice when I'd go to either use a product or purchase a product, it wasn't up to whether it was content or um, aesthetics, not up to what I liked. So that's when we started to kind of dive into a little bit more products, but um, I really don't want, I really like it to stay research-based um, and every product, in my opinion, at least is carefully chosen to make sure it still falls within kind of our, our brand standards. The design, the aesthetics that you mentioned, and the branding is the, probably the thing that most captured my attention. Evidence-based is kind of a trigger word for me. I, I grab onto anything, although that's maybe going out of style. But when I got to the website and noticed that it's so well done, and I think you're using Squarespace, Squarespace which I am too, which is probably the best service out there. No doubt. But the, the things that you do produce, the research briefs, the, um, the iBook, I mean, what led you to make sure that that design was up to standard? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, it's just personal preference. So I, I, I kind of come from more of a visual and art background as opposed to maybe science. I mean, they can coexist, of course. But, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm into products and services that work well, that are fluid, that are elegant, that are, that are you know, modern, but not over the top modern, but still retain classic elements, all that fun stuff. So, um, so really, I think the and a lot of it was, you know, when I first started out in practice, I'm handing out things that I just was like, ah, this just looks like it was created 25 years ago. Yes, and it that didn't make like, me feel good. You know? <laughs> it's the uh, fifth photocopy, right. you know, and you, ah, that's, no I, I appreciate that so much. Do you have a design background? Not, not, uh, not formally, but I, th uh, it's something that I've always been really interested in. I actually played music forever. So, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand. So it's always been with every band that I've played in, I've been heavily involved in what's going to go on with, whether it's a show poster, whether it's a, the disc itself, um, whether it's, you know, press photos, whatever the case may be, I've been really into what I think looks good or what does not look good. Um, so my skill set in terms of, Photoshop and things like that is average, minimal to average. Um, but I, I have, I'll create drawings and I'll know what I want. So then I'll be able to kind of, you know, match with somebody who can actually execute it and, you know, kind of work from there. So how much of this are you doing on your own and how much do you have a, a paid designer or someone <laughs> yeah. helping you out? Yeah. Um, I am the only employee of the evidence based chiropractor so I'm it <laughs> but um, but I work with I work for the website build out um, and the initial branding all of the initial I did myself about a year ago I transitioned to what it, it looks like currently that I worked with a company out of St. Petersburg Florida called Harbor um, and since then I've found another person through them that now I'm working with kind of just on an as needed basis, but it's really a product by product basis. So with Harbor, we created all the brand standards. Um, so then that's the jumping point. So now my current designer who knows all of them and works with them, um, is able to kind of just take that and run with it. Um, and then we're able to kind of tweak and, and make things appropriate to whatever the specific product or service is. So that's awesome. And you've, I mean, you've got great photography, um, like I said, the, there's some kind of clinic artwork, some posters that are meant for the, and that beautiful typography. Yeah. Yeah. That's all them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so for, as far as the, um, as far as the photography goes, I've had two different photographers. They both live local and are both friends of mine. So that's been really cool. So, um, and they're just, again, that just works out because I like people that do those kind of jobs. So, you know, creative jobs. So that when I knew I wanted a specific aesthetic, I kind of talked to each of them. They worked out, both worked on two different projects, two, two different sets of photography. So we were able to kind of, you know, just decide, I would, you know, and again, I kind of know what I want as far as, you know, 
depth and, and the coloration and things like that, but I can't execute any of it. So I was able <laughs> to really give them a shot list of exactly what I wanted, the angles that I wanted, what I was looking for, and then they were able to kind of use their actual expertise and make it happen. So, um, so yeah, thanks. I, I, I think that one, that's one thing that I pride myself on with the whole system is that I think it's just as far as not only content, I hope the content is, is as good as anything, if not better than anything available, but certainly I think the aesthetic, um, you know, not to trump the content, but supports it in a way that's nice and makes me feel good. And ultimately it's all about stuff that I want to use, to be honest with you. So um, when other docs grab onto it and like it, that, that's cool. That makes me feel good, of course. I think that's great because the content is awesome. Um, and I think most people have great content, but it's what I appreciate is your awareness of the importance of design and that even though you might be on a budget, you know, you need to make the effort to have good design. And I think I think a lot of us make that mistake and we default to Comic Sans or Papyrus, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. fonts are just kind of anathema in yeah. the design world. So I appreciate that and I hope that more chiropractors that are doing services like you begin to recognize the need for that. And I think, I think I'm seeing it more and more. Yeah. Um, now are you, you're still at the Florida orthopedic Institute? Great question. <laughs> Another great question. Um, I just started at a new group this oh. past week. So very timely question, I should say. Um, so yeah, December 18th was my last day at Florida Orthopedic Institute. Now I've moved on to their regional spine group, and now I've moved on to, I guess, a nationwide spine group. Oh. So I'm happy to kind of di dive into that when I, whenever you want as far as what that means. I, I think that uh, some of the questions upcoming were going to be about my practice. So. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. curious how much how much your practice experience being in a integrative or a mixed setting led to the development of the evidence based chiropractor. Yeah, it is a uh, it it is why ultimately. Um, so kind of the the backstory is the evidence based chiropractor didn't exist. It just was something that you know, of course, it didn't exist at a certain point in time. But um, you know, when I kind of started it, it was not started as oh, this would be a cool thing to do. It was more in terms of I joined uh, the Florida Orthopedic Institute and it was a matter of then going to spine conference and going to grand rounds and kind of seeing how the medical doctors work. So I didn't have a built-in referral base. So I didn't just start and all of a sudden, oh, wow, I'm in an integrative setting. I'm flooded. Like, um, So it was a challenge to figure out, well, what how can I build those relationships with them? How does this work? What are they interested in? So I started noting that a lot of their clinical decision making was based on research. So logically I said, well, what do you know? Let me take a look back at some of the things that I have. And I started to look at new research and I found, wow, there's way more than I thought here. This is good. Um, so I started putting together really rudimentary research briefs at that point in time. So, um, and started giving it to them and starting conversations and saying, hey, here's a little bit about what I do. And this was in Spine Journal. This was in European Spine Journal. This was in, I mean, I love JMPT. There's no problem with anything like that as well. But a lot of, if you want to say their journals, I started to pull all research from um, and gain referrals and kind of, uh, I guess you could say, build relationships within my practice. So. Then, you know, naturally I said, wow, if the docs in my practice all like this, I wonder if the docs across the street like this. So then I started it local with family physicians and things like that. And it was totally niche, just making them for myself. There's no, you know, quote unquote business or service. It was just as a matter of necessity to build my own practice. It started working out well. Um, with the local other local docs outside of my practice. And that's when I started to say, okay, well, I know one of my good friends that, you know, is 20 miles away. So I started saying, well, send me your logo. So then I created him at the time. Again, these were very rudimentary, but then I started saying, Hey, would you be interested in like using something like this? And he's like, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is fantastic. And I started looking out there and I really didn't see anything on the market, in my opinion, that suited that need for chiropractors. And with the way I was able to kind of start stockpiling research, I was like, I could do this in a way that would be very advantageous for chiropractors, very affordable, but also use the knowledge that I've already gained as far as kind of what works and what doesn't work and kind of refined what was going on um, as far as the aesthetic of the research brief and the content to what I thought would work in the best way possible. And we're still constantly refining with docs all around the globe to make sure that it is you know, the best and most usable product. So your niche really is marketing to MDs using <laughs> research about chiropractic and yeah. you've got your iBook is um 
is just that marketing to to medical doctors. Yep. And it in the intro, which is the only part I've read because I'm a student and haven't found the, <laughs> the fifteen dollars, which really is reasonable. I will pay fifteen dollars for any ebook. Um, if it sounds like it's kind of a four four step thing, you get uh, kind of get the material together, make a list of doctors to market to, make the meetings and execute them, and then follow up and your your program the evidence-based chiropractor material helps doctors do all of that yeah um it's, the book kind of lays it the book lays everything out like stepwise so the book is kind of a to z so hopefully the book let's say there's a doc out there that says ah, i can create my own research briefs i kind of like what i'm doing then the book hopefully is a good resource for them to kind of execute a to z using what we've learned and of course like i tell all the docs you know none of it is you know, none of it's gospel. It's always going to be evolving. It's always going to be changing. And, you know, with anything, you want to do it within the integrity of yourself and your own practice. So there's no magic essentially in it. It's just a matter of finding the most efficient and effective way to go about things. So the book kind of takes things A to Z. And then the materials that I think that we offer, specifically the research briefs, are the support behind that. And then, of course, any member also has access to the what we call the members vault, which has a bunch of templates and guides. So, for instance, as you know, in the book, it kind of talks about case notes. Some docs don't know where to start. So any member doc has access to templates or things that we found work best as far as that as far as that's concerned. So um, and then, of course, any member doc also has access to the book and, and all that jazz. So, um, but really, the book should can also be a standalone piece for docs just saying, "Hey, I don't know really where to start, or maybe I am doing something good. I just want to do it better." Um, then the book, I think, is a good resource as far as that goes to just help them uh, solidify their vision. That's excellent. Uh, so, looking on the website, there's a lot of material. There's a good a good amount of free tools. You have one section specifically with free tools, which are some great. PDFs to download, uh, but there's a student portal, a student program as well. What can students get out of this? Any student um, that becomes part of the student program, it's completely free. Um, and basically what the students get is one thing that we haven't implemented yet, but is to happen in 2015, um, is a kind of a monthly call. So it's just getting on and saying, hey, what's going on? And my vision for it is that, you know, some of the challenge has just been time zone issues. So, you know, that's, that seems to be the big challenge because the students are really spread out around the globe. So, and I really wanted to have, I really would like it to be a unified time where everybody can kind of mastermind together and say, hey, what's going on over there? Hey, what's going on over here? Maybe preset a few questions that, I, you know, at least I can probably provide some insight on, maybe have other uh, docs come on and guest spot, basically just to help students out and answer questions from a, you know, kind of a real world practicing perspective, which I think is important. Um, but what is actually going on right now in the student portal is uh, each month the, a research brief, the exact research brief that we white label and send out to all of our member docs, we put... Um, just branded as the evidence-based chiropractor in the student portal. So any student is able to download that. The same thing that my docs are getting every month um, to hand out to medical doctors, the students can access them um, and kind of get a feel for, you know, not only what we do, that's kind of secondary, but first they can kind of see what the if, if they're not able to keep up on the research due to being so busy in school and trying just trying to get through, um, they can kind of see what what's out there and and how it relates to practice because all the research briefs are not only a statement of what the research is but also you know there's sort of positioning as far as what it means in practice. I appreciate these briefs because they're they're not simplistic. Uh, but they really make it easier for a student to understand what's going on in the research. And there's, I think all of them or most of them are a single PDF, a single page PDF, uh, and pro provide really the key material. And that's important, I think, because, I mean, even I being at an evidence-based school am one of only a few who, who actively go out and, like, read research. Yeah. And, but it's, su it's such a time commitment and it's my goal this past quarter was to read one paper per week just one per week that's good and i w i wasn't able to do it every week but i you know you come across papers all the time yeah. so <clears throat> this makes it you know it just makes it really accessible and it makes it um achievable for a student to keep on top 
of the research. He recently came out with the top 10 chiropractic research papers. Mm-hmm. Uh, give us maybe the, the top three. Yeah, yeah. Strictly opinion, by the way. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. But um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, and you really hit a, a I'm going to touch on one point before I do that, and that's the single-page nature of it. Um, and for any students, I think that's important. Um, earlier, I alluded to the fact of there. I made rudimentary briefs before. Those briefs were multiple pages. They had tons of content. I was diving in and doing all that, and there was multiple pages. Of gra- Each one was probably five or six pages long. Um, and what I found and what we ended up finding was docs just don't have the time. Like They, they don't have time to read that. So just get them... The, the brass tacks of it and you know strip cut the fat essentially make sure that it's pointed make sure that it's relevant make sure that they have the information that's necessary for them to make it actionable in their practice so um, so yeah and that's where we kind of settled on the single page now as time goes on in the next 10 or 15 years if it becomes strictly a digital product there might be some more play with that but I think as a you know as a as a hard copy physical item the single page is really where it's at um, so that's important. As far as reading research, um, not only as a student, but you uh, as a uh, future chiropractor, but many present chiropractors are in the same boat. So I spoke multiple times at uh, some chiropractic continuing education conferences and seminars this past year. And I'd go over maybe 10 to 15 research briefs, you know, and I, you know, or research pieces. And um, you know, I'd always ask, especially for the big ones in my mind, I'd say, has anybody ever heard of this? 200 docs in the room, five hands go up. You know, and that's what they've heard of. You know, never mind read. I didn't say, hey, did you actually right, read it? Right. So, um, so, you know, I think that that's, you know, there's a big divide, I think, as far as, uh, as far as that's concerned. And I think, you know, like I'll say in the seminars always is, you know, it, to me, you know, find what resonates with you. If if it's let's say more subluxation based, Matt, Matthew McCoy is a great doc out there producing at the best research that he can. Um, then you know, on the more you know musculoskeletal side, of course, you can you know look to JMPT. As far as you know, crossing over, and sometimes they have chiropractic or manual therapy mixed with modalities. Um, you know, is more spine European spine journal. So you know, there's a plethora of resources available, regardless of whether you're a family practice doc, regardless of what sports practice you know so you know just find what i always encourage everybody is you know find what you're into and then go for it it doesn't necessarily have to be the research that i think is important you know it's really about what you think is important so then you're able to then resonate and you know bring that to the people that you resonate with in your town and your community and build those relationships regardless of who they're with so um now rather than go through the the, your top 10 because it's free students can access this and they can download it I think I'd be more interested in, in hearing what your process is. How can students, other than getting your briefs, yeah. how, what are some tools or, um, or ways that they can be more active in reading research without spending all of their free time? Yeah, two uh, two best ways by far is PubMed. Most students are familiar with Pub PubMed, um, you know, P-U-B-M-E-D. Um, it's a... Uh, I don't know what I don't know the correct word. You know, repository of research information for journals worldwide. Um, and what you're able to do for free is set up an account and then do uh, a keyword alert. So you can, you know, the keyword could be chiropractic, it can be spinal manipulative therapy, it could be adjustment, whatever you want it to be, and it can be multiple. So and then they'll email you at whatever duration of time you indicate. So whenever something new is posted with those keywords, once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. Um, so that is invaluable because it's going to pick up pretty much any registered journal in the world and automatically deliver those headlines and titles of the brief, of the research uh, articles into your inbox at whatever time you dictate. So, I mean, you can't really get much more straightforward than that. Uh, that's the best. And you can kind of do the same thing with a Google, like a Google News Alert or anything like that. So within Google, whether, whether it's with sort of an aggregator or whether it's just within... Um, you know, a, a general Google search. You can you can kind of highlight and have them alert you. But PubMed search is probably the best because it's going to grab the research articles, whereas a Google News Feed alert is going to be more based upon news, which can be not research based but sensational. But both are probably good because you get a good idea of what's actually going on. Yeah, the Google News is interesting to see what other people are hearing about. 
but you still have to do well i find that they almost never give you a link to the paper so you end up having to go to pubbent anyway to find yeah. the actual paper yeah yeah. How much of your, your research, your searching for and finding papers, is purely digital versus printing out the papers? Um, everything as far as my looking for the articles is digital. So uh, I do PubMed searches, um, and then this journals that I subscribe to and or have access to through my practices, I look up what I want. Uh, my process for it is whenever I see something that I like, then of course I'll download it, and that's of course a digital copy. I'll file it according to what um, where it resides. So whether it's a cervical paper, a safety paper, a cost effectiveness paper, a lumbar paper, I'll kind of file it away in accordance with you know the body region or type of journal article. And then what I'll do is previous to making a research brief, just I just like then I'll print it. So then I'll cue them in accordance with what I what I want to do over the course of the next few months as far as research briefs. Um, and, but I'll always leave play if something comes up and it's just a fantastic article that's released this month. That'll go to the head of the line. But you know I probably have a few hundred articles you know kind of stashed away at this point in time that I feel like are great articles that are relevant. Um, so I'll print them out before I do the research brief because I just like to hold it. And then I'll do my circling, all of my notations and things like that while I have a physical copy that has been printed. And then I'll go back and create my research brief from my notes on that on that copy. So it's kind of a combination. I guess it's kind of a combination of both. I've never really thought about it before. <laughs> That's actually my process. <laughs> well, that's cool to hear. I could geek out for another hour about research stuff, but I want to I want to learn a little more about you as a doctor. Um, how long have you been practicing? Uh, I graduated in 2006, okay. so nine years, nine years now. And what what led you to decide to go into chiropractic? Uh, well, my uh, my dad had a back, ultimately it comes down to my dad had a back injury. So I was at uh, an undergraduate school, my father hurt his back, he went to see a chiropractor, he improved and got well, and he said, you got to meet this guy when you come back at Christmas break. So I went back home, I met the chiropractor, he was super high energy, super charismatic guy, and was like, what are you gonna do? And I was like, ah, I'm into healthcare, I think I wanna do uh, orthopedics, you know, but I, I'm kinda not sure. Um, but that bet, bet had been what I'd been interested in since I was probably 12. I did endoscopic uh, knee surgical paper when I was like 12, you know, 12 years old as far as school <laughs> projects. And so, um, the, so he kinda told me a little bit about what he did as a chiropractor and it kinda, it resonated with my thoughts and beliefs without knowing, without really knowing that much about it before. Um, and then by the end of that conversation, which was like a two hour lunch conversation, he's like, hold on a second. He called, he's like the alumni guy for, for Palmer. So he calls up Palmer and says, I have somebody on the phone that I think they'll want to speak to you. You know, again, put me on the spot there a little bit. So uh, they sent me information and it kind of went from there. But then come to find out later on down the road, I hadn't put two and two together. But then I found out that my great grandfather also had been a chiropractor in the 20s and studied under BJ and, and all that fun stuff. So, you know, all of those things kind of tailored in into each other. How do you see uh, chiropractic, uh, how is it different than 20 years ago? Uh, I can speak to nine years ago. Okay. Nine years. <laughs> so, yeah. Is that when you first, is that when your well, dad first I, went I guess to chiropractic? What, well, that was probably, no, I was probably 18. Maybe uh, the first time I was exposed to chiropractic was 15 years. That was probably okay. 15 years ago. I'm th 34 now. That was when I was about eight, 18, maybe. You know, so, um, it's difficult to say the vibe of it at the time because it seems very similar to, you know, a lot. He practiced in, in a way that's very similar to how many, you know, family chiropractic offices operate today, from what I know. You know, so just from being, you know, as, as far as the patient side of things go um, or the observer side of things. So, as far as, you know, the back end, who the heck knows? Um, but, I think that as time has gone on, specifically since I've gotten out of school, you know, maybe nine years ago, which really got me to see the full spectrum of what's going on, um, you know, in my opinion, I think that the lines of kind of interdisciplinary communication and relationship building are more wide open than they ever have been before, and, you know, even compared to just nine years ago. And some of that, much of that has to do with the breadth and depth of research that has been published in that time. So, you know, even if a lot of docs, you know, you can, it's, you know, kind of the old exposure, you know, first people ridicule and hate, then they accept and all this kind of stuff. I think it's sort of the same thing. I mean, even the most ardent, um, 
you know, American Medical Association supporting doctor of the 60s and 70s when chiropractic was in the big fight, um, you know, has now just gotten, you know, in, in their own journals kind of hammered over the head with what I would consider to be pro-chiropractic research so that, that even the most ardent has t tended to say, well, there might be something there. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the bare minimum, which then, you know, opens the door for further communication. You know, I I would agree that the <clears throat> interdisciplinary approach is is more prevalent than ever. But I also hear as I'm listening to podcasts and following outspoken chiropractors online even more than more than ten years ago is this this uh, campaigning to identify ourselves as not being in the medical model, as being completely different. Where do you see chiropractic going in the next 10 years? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I'm not sure is the honest answer. Um, you know, one of my chiropractic heroes that I speak about all the time is Reggie Gold. So he's about as far outside of the medical model as you can possibly get. I mean, he, w he was so far outside of it that even at the time where chiropractic was in the 70s, he said, that's too medical, I'm starting spinology. You know, so, um, <laughs> exactly. you know, so, I mean, he is as, about as radical as you can get. And he I has the, the, the famous quote that he would always say, no chiropractor ever, ever, anywhere has ever diagnosed or treated a disease. Correct. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not what we do as chiropractors is his claim is that we, we just adjust. No Correct. matter what's going on with the patient, we just adjust. Correct. Which Correct. has, which does not fit in an integrative model, in my opinion. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Um, so, in some ways, it's sort of, you know, I hate to use the term ironic, but it's interesting that I would cite him as probably my biggest copyright <laughs> hero. Of course, considering where I'm at right now, and who knows what he would think of it. For, fortunately, I was able to meet him and get actually get adjusted by him when he was still with us. Um, so, you know, that was that was absolutely fantastic. And hear him speak for a, a two-day uh, event off campus at Palmer. So that was that was really you know something I'll always hold dear. But um, you know, as far as where chiropractic can go in the future, you know, it's difficult for me to say. I you know my personal beliefs or that I am not for the prescription of drugs or any integration for drugs or surgery into chiropractic. That's my personal opinion. So I believe that we can operate in a unique and distinct fashion by highlighting the chiropractic adjustment and provide valuable service that way while also working with other docs. So uh, an example of this would be I have a couple of really good examples, but you know, um, just as a medical doctor or a podi any sort of medical doctor, a podiatrist, they're not going to be able to take care of everything. So they, of course, they refer and work with other physicians. Um, and I certainly see chiropractic, um, you know, physicians or doctors of chiropractic within that circle. But I don't think that that necessarily means that we need to do anything that anybody else does. I think that we can remain separate and distinct by highlighting what we do the best and what we have the most training for without, for lack of a better term, diluting what that is, which in my opinion is the chiropractic adjustment. Um, there's many professions that can do modalities. Uh, I don't know. I don't really do many modalities. Personally, I'm kind of going off on a tangent right now, but um, you know, myself. Um, if I were to do e stim on somebody, it would be very difficult for me to say that I can do e stim better than a physical therapist or anybody else. You kind of just place the pads there, and you know you may have a trick of the trade or two, but it's sort of straightforward. Whereas in my opinion, still the chiropractic adjustment or spinal manipulation, whatever you want to dictate it, um, still has an art component to it. So therefore, I want just as I want the surge. If I had to have surgery, thankfully, knock on wood, I've never had to, and hopefully, I never will. But I would want the surgeon with the most experience in his craft. Um, if I need an adjustment or I want an adjustment, I want the person with the most experience in their craft. This is where I, I get, di it's difficult for me to buy into other professions creeping onto what we're doing because the bottom line is if they're learning it in a weekend, that should, to say it doesn't hold a candle to what we're able to do would be an understatement as far as I'm concerned. Um, so now as far as where that goes in the future, I think it is difficult to say. Um, because certainly there are a vast array of opinions in chiropractic from the objective straight chiropractors um, all the way to you know the full full on let's do drugs and surgery chiropractors. Um, 
it's difficult to say, in my opinion, also without having a unifying body. That makes things very difficult. So um, it's difficult politically to get things done without a unifying body because the dollars just aren't behind what we're able to accomplish as far as lobbying is concerned, which is a whole nother ballgame. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so so the, the, the answer is I don't know. I certainly hope that we don't include drugs and surgery, but I certainly think there is a place for us at a table with other doctors without being completely isolated. I want to put you on the spot a bit, but I think you're up for the challenge. Yeah. I want to bring together uh, the marketing to MDs, the research, and the defined role of chiropractic in the medical model. Uh, I interviewed a medical doctor, Dr. Mark Chrislip, who's the host of the Quackcast and is very outspoken against all alternative medicines, including chiropractic. And I asked him, had he ever been to a chiropractor? No. Would he ever know? But he had a cervical disc herniation a while back. And, and we kind of came to the agreement, I, I didn't know the research well enough at the time, that he would have gone if there was evidence that chiropractic would have been beneficial for that condition. Mm-hmm. How, how would you approach him as a chiropractor and present research that might help him in that decision? Uh, as a physician or as an independent patient? If you were a patient. Well, um, well, I, you know, let let's say as a, as an MD, because that's because that's what we're talking about here is marketing to MDs. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the papers that comes immediately to mind off the top of my head, and I'm not going to be able to cite the, the source of the paper, unfortunately. But you know, there was there's a really good study as far as specifically with the cervical disc herniation with radiculopathy. Um, there is a paper that shows you know Cox technique, essentially flexion distraction technique in the cervical spine, reducing intradiscal pressure. So um, again, that's not going to be your traditional high, high velocity or diversified adjustment. Um, but with that sort of flexion distraction capability on a Cox table, they were found that there were pressure decreases intradiscally. So if there was a disc herniation causing pressure on a nerve root, theoretically that is by far the best treatment option because it's the only way you could get non-surgical, potential non-surgical decompression. So. You're, it is a very specific case, of course. You know, it is, um, yes. But I think, um, but I think, you know, as far as, you know, kind of taking one step back from that specifically that study, I think, you know, one of the big things to emphasize always, in my opinion, is that chiropractors, uh, many MDs confuse what I say. Is, you know, chiro- uh, many MDs confuse the profession of chiropractic with the practice of chiropractic. So they believe chiropractic equals crunch. So they see somebody who can't move their neck, has ridiculous pain, whether it's lumbar, cervical, wherever, and they can't imagine a high velocity adjustment doing anything because they're like, this person can barely move as it is, you know, and they just don't know because they don't have the experience with it. While we may choose to do that technique because it may be what we find to be the best technique for the patient, I think it's important to always let medical doctors know, and most chiropractors, I would say 90 plus, have at least one low velocity technique, whether it's activator or flexion distraction, and at least one high velocity technique, whether that's Gonstead or, or, or diverse, you know, general diversified classification. So I always think it's important to let the physicians know, hey, we have an array of techniques available from low velocity, low impact, to the more traditional or high velocity techniques. So we're always going to evaluate the patient, examine the patient, correlate that with what we find in diagnostics and make the best decision possible in the most comfortable position possible for the patient. So you know, I think it's important to highlight those because many times, again, I, I would say if I were to ask that doc what he thought chiropractors did, I guarantee you he would say that if I were a chiropractor, he's going to crunch my neck and hurt me. And you know, the bottom line is, whilst the chiropractor may choose to do a Gonstead adjustment or a diversified adjustment, um, the, uh, the chiropractor also may have chosen to do a decompressive technique, which may have changed this guy's world. <laughs> you know, so um, so that would be where I'd start. And would you provide a research brief in, in a case like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if the doc requests it, I mean, I, I usually don't do a la carte, if you want to say, for yeah. medical doctors. Um, but certainly, you know, if, I ever talk, if I'm ever talking with a doc, I've had docs say, um, one time I was presenting at a, at a Grand Rounds at a hospital, and I think I, I'm not going to be able to remember the specifics of it, but, but the bottom line, the doc was saying like, oh, well, the flexion distraction compared to uh, traditional traction in the lumbar spine what's the difference? Like, is one better than the other? I'm comfortable just doing what I'm doing now. So I said, oh, 
I, I, and I didn't have something prepared. Obviously, it was just a question off the top, top of his head. So I said, let me take a look at it and I'll find something. And, and I found something that had you know some differences between the two. And I, you know, flexion distraction does work, in my opinion, superior to you know prone flexion distraction technique gets more decompression than a supine you know, axial distraction. Um, it's just, it's more highly targeted. You're obviously working within, you know, your palm and you're able to focus energy, of course, dissipation, but you're able to get more decompression doing it that way. And in my opinion, also you're able to get the human element, which is important as far as not only, Hey, I'm touching the patient, like some sort of magic placebo, but I mean, in terms of actually feeling out the segment, as opposed to just pressing a number on a machine where all of a sudden it goes and who knows what the patient's feeling at any given time. So you're able to get real world feedback as far as what's going on with the patient. Um, so again, sorry, going off on a tangent a little bit there, but, um, I think, you know, it's always good to say, if you do not have it handy, say, let me take a look and I'll get back to you. We're winding down, uh, running out of time. For those students who are prospective students thinking of chiropractic, a couple questions. Uh, how would you explain to them the importance of being, staying up to date, being aware of the research on chiropractic today? I think it's the most imperative thing that uh, any student or, pers or prospective student or doc can do. Um, again, because in my, in my opinion, regardless of whether you're family practice, subluxation based, musculoskeletal based, extremity based, sports based, you name it, there is research or a supporting organization that is attempting to produce research. The quality of will wildly vary, of course, but it is of the utmost importance, regardless of practice style, to find a company service or do it yourself. Um, find the research that resonates with your proposed practice style. Get knowledgeable about it because it's going to help you build those relationships, whether it's with a midwife or doula, whether it's with an MD, whether it's with you know sports hero surgeon James Andrews. It doesn't matter. They're going to want to ask you questions, and the more knowledge that you have, the better you'll be able to answer those questions, which inevitably serves the patient better. If you were to do it all again, all over again, let's back up to before your dad hurt his, his back, but you know what you know now, yeah. what school would you choose? What school would you recommend a student? <laughs> <choosing>? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I would, my honest answer would probably be life um, because I went to Palmer in part because Palmer, Florida was uh, Guy Reekman's baby. So that was when he was Chancellor of Palmer is when I started. The now, idea, did you go to Palmer or Palmer, Florida? I went to Palmer, Florida. Okay. But, but I should clarify. I went to Palmer, Davenport, and I took uh, two classes that I needed to start chiropractic school at Scott Community College, which is right next door. My intention was to – it's in Bettendorf, Iowa. My intention was to start at Palmer, Iowa. However um, – I, while I was taking those classes, I learned that Palmer, Florida would be opening. And I previously went to University of Tampa. I loved Florida. So um, I made the decision to go back down here to Palmer, Florida, and I was one of the first graduating classes from Palmer, Florida. And they had, so, they had a very interesting approach with uh, everything being, well, not everything, but a lot more focused on digital as well as a different approach to systems of the body. Absolutely. And that sort of went in line with what Dr. Reekman was trying to do at the time. So he was, you know, Palmer, uh, Iowa is very, been there a long time. I was saying it's been there over 100 years. Um, and it's difficult to get change. Um, and certainly you don't want to, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing these the best way possible, regardless of location. But uh, Palmer, Florida, I feel, I felt like he felt and he might speak otherwise on this, but um, that it was an opportunity to try some new things and be able to get you know an updated approach to chiropractic schooling. Um, unfortunately, as probably everybody knows, he, you know, within two semesters of me going there, there was the rift that happened, and he ended up at Life. Um, so that's where I would um, you know I would probably lead somebody because I think that he's a great leader. Um, and I think that he, you know, what I see from life as far as, getting back to the origins of our conversation, as far as uh, aesthetics and communication and things like that, I feel like it's top notch. I haven't been to school there, so it's very difficult for me to say as far as the education. I know they went through some accreditation issues probably eight years ago now, so it's been a while. Um, but, um, 
but I, I like what they're doing up there and I like his approach and I know that their numbers since he's um, you know become the head of that school have just increased dramatically so and if any listeners are interested in learning more about life I did interview a student there uh, last year and I'm checking right now I think it's episode seven or so um, so I did interview a student who has recently graduated from life and it is um, a a gorgeous campus, huge, probably, I think probably the largest school. Palmer might be close, um, but definitely one to look at. Well, where can, where can students and doctors learn more about you and follow you? Sure. Um, www.theevidencebasedchiropractor.com. So very simple, very straightforward. Uh, and then pretty much any social media backslash the evidence-based chiropractor. So whether it's Twitter or whether it's Facebook, a lot of it's all, you know, this, you know, the content is the content. So you can go to any location. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, we post on Facebook daily, um, you know, things that hopefully their chiropractors can pass on to their, you know, patients or, you know, use as far as that's concerned. Um, and then also, you know, probably about five days a week, even though the holidays, I got, I got, I got a little behind as far as putting out articles and blogs on our website, um, which is kind of research and marketing based uh, at the evidence base at chiropractor.com. So either location um, or if they have any questions, concerns, comments, anything like that, I'm always free to chat uh, at the evidence based chiropractor at gmail.com. And I recommend all students follow them online, but also go to the evidence based chiropractor and sign up for the student program because as students, it's difficult to afford these excellent uh, uh, research briefs, but there's a lot of information there that is really useful, and I, I find myself going there every once in a while and checking it out. Thank so you. Dr. Langman, thanks so much. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.